Thank you um, so much. I'm really grateful to be here, and um, I'm super thankful to Areti Markopoulou and uh, the Institute for Advanced Studies in Catalonia for the invitation. Um, I will share with you one of my most recent projects, Closed Worlds, or What is the Power of Shit, um, which was an exhibition at the Storefront for Art and Architecture in New York, a conference, and is now being developed into a book um, upcoming by Lars Smuller Publishers. And instead of starting with the kind of bulk of the research, I will present a kind of small personal narrative, um, a narrative between reality and fiction, a very small one, but at the same time, a big one. So, I live every day in a closed world that is warm, cozy, equipped with power and high-speed Wi-Fi that I need to survive as much as I need oxygen. Outside it snows. I am here, though, airtight and well-connected. Inside, I breathe my own exhalations, and data recirculates like air. The air is fresh. It is blown by fans. Data refreshes. It is supported by data farms somewhere that I don't know where they exist. My urine and excrement are controlled by a system of ducts, pipes, wires, plants, and marsh microbes and redeemed into water and food, which I can eat. This morning, the thick interior windows drip with heavy condensation. Like most New Yorkers, I live in a capsule. My atmosphere is fully recycled by the plants and the soil they are rooted in my place, and by the labyrinths of noisy ductwork and pipes strung through the foliage. IKEA's recent product line suggests that anyone can grow a garden inside, and so I follow their lead and grow vegetables and tomatoes, feeding them with my own shit. Inside my microcosm, my closed world, the living and the manufactured have been intertwined and this is obviously an aspiration as long as a steam engine running through a meadow as described by Leo Marx. The purpose is to nurture other complexities, me. Life cannot get any denser inside my closed world. And this metaphor, this kind of personal narrative, is nothing new. Here you see the work of House Rucker Co., an Austrian group um, in the 60s and 70s, very famous, and their piece called A Piece of Nature, Ein Stück Natur, which was originally produced for an art fair in Cologne in 1973, and then published in the magazine Casabella in 1976. They're showing a contained and secured microcosm in the jar, which is as much a sample of nature as much as a representation of Earth in its totality. This tiny Earth replica marks the end of nature as an unbounded field and the beginning of its reconstitution and re-engineering in pieces. It is a powerful illustration of a period of intense environmental debates, the 70s oil crisis, obviously, precisely because it manifests something like a fossil or a lab sample, our lost idea of the untamed land. The idea, nevertheless, of absorbing and reconstituting pieces of nature in man-made environments is no longer a poetic metaphor to be displayed in a museum. It has become profitably real. Closed worlds might be committed to a deeply rooted fantasy of architecture producing nature, yet they're fully integrated within the very fabric of reality. In a way, all buildings and large chunks of cities are closed worlds, atmospheric enclosures that define collectives. Closed worlds are always internally rational, self-referential, sites of becoming, processing input and output. And this does not only imply to the kind of fictional project that you see on the screen, like Minister Fuller and Soji Sadao's famous dome under Manhattan in 1960. Our indoor environments today corporate office buildings, for example, are in fact politically charged spaces that reflect political agendas, social ideals, and culturally specific standards of taste and judgment. Because data and measurements in environmental control offer trustworthy and convincing mediums and illustrations on how to develop sustainability criteria, 
in the, the challenging environments of our ob overpopulated and dense cities, they have become pervasive and they have persisted for a very long time, even though most times they make absolutely no sense. And this is an example of a measured environmental control space, Climatron, one of the first uh, biomes enclosure that was really controlled by a, a data uh, center that uh, fostered the development of 15,000 plants in St. Louis, Missouri. Take, for example, the way in which sealed buildings, and uh, probably this is something that you all know, it's one of my favorite movies, uh, Jacques Tati's Playtime in the 60s. So in, take, take as an absurd example the way in which sealed buildings have been redeemed as a sustainable design practice in favor of minimizing energy loss at the cost of air and light. The manipulation of organic and ecological processes contained within artificial enclosures have become metaphors for enforcing cultural and biased standards of life by recalling the power of data and cultural capital. This is not to say that we are, that we are approaching the apocalypse and we should all build contained domes where we should live inside, not at all. It is simply to witness, to observe, and to critique how, how ideas go long, undergo long journeys of migration and to witness a slow, silent, yet substantial migration of ideas of closed worlds for entirely antithetical political agendas, from military ideas on creating space capsules to conquer outer space, to colonize the inner space of the oceans and the outer space, and, um, and then how these ideas become countercultural ideologies for self-sufficient living and uh, express the leftist movement um, and ideas for self-reliance and autonomy. And somewhere in between, they have prevailed and governed the contemporary environments of our lives in um, our daily environments in cities and buildings and define sustainable living. To better explore this journey of ideological migration, I will show and briefly uh, explain three case studies which are included in the exhibition's archive and the book, and which will hopefully allow us to ask a few questions. How are sustainable terms developed and institutionalized? How do they become tropes to signal new political ideologies, always expressing the left and the right simultaneously? Veiled under the ethics of environmentalism, a new agenda has become the norm. Net zero, ecological footprint, minimizing energy loss through sealing, loop systems, and other terms is now a new form of capital. And I will start with this first episode, the NASA Langley Simulator in 1960, which is a living pod by the NASA Langley um, Center um, along with general dynamics. It was manufactured as an experimental life support facility, a hermetically sealed steel structure con um, designed to take care of the basic physiological needs of four men for a full year with minimal resupply of food every three months. These men lived there for four months as an experiment of how to create one of the first manned operations. The men were monitored and videotaped, something like an original version of a Big Brother show, and became the theme of a promotional educational television show entitled Living in Space, The Case for Regeneration. The film began with heroic statements about the virtues of man as a heroic explorer who was insatiable and could build a stairway to the stars where the conditions are, are friendly to his biological system. Man managed to go into the vacuum and experience all these strange conditions of weightlessness and return himself to the blanket of air. So at this moment, outer space, which was the ultimate frontier in the context of the space race and the tension of the Cold War colonizing this unfriendly territory um, was very, very important, but the key to the colonization of this territory 
was not the invention of rockets and the research of Werner von Braun, but the management and reinvention of human physiology to transport men into outer space, he could only go with his artificial environmental earth bubble. And this is an important diagram that really clarifies this argument and accompanies the film. As we can witness from the film and other promotional diagrams that NASA has created um, to, uh, to inhabit spacecrafts, a new biologically informed image of man was emerging, one where human agency was instrumentalized in terms of input and output. Diagrams illustrate men entirely bounded to his surrounding environment with all of the machines around him, since only with the service of digesters, converters, dryers, and dehumidifiers could all cycles of ingestion and excretion be closed and redirected back into the body. This was a very different image from already established figures of men in architectural debates. Um, think, for example, the Vitruvian men and the Corbusius modular who represented cosmic subject. This was very, very different. The image, though, of this feedback man came at a high, almost deadly cost in the resurgence of a primitive fear that a man could be buried in the combustion products of his own body. In the case of a malfunction, excreting could kill him or contaminate his immediate environment. In this case, material loss was simply not allowed. In the actual experiment where four men were sealed for extended periods of time, the men had nausea, headaches, and eventually contaminated the system with their human waste. Things like shed hair, fingernails, and skin that were not calculated by the mathematical description of the system infiltrated the, collection, the, 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 uh, the machines. It is important to observe that everyone did their job right. They did store their waste in the designated compartments, but floating waste materials so finely grained that couldn't be incorporated in the recycling process escaped and randomly coagulated in contaminants. I see here I have to speed up, so I'll move quickly um, to the second um, case study, which is very different. From a small prototype, it is a gigantic utopia, kind of like a Beneezer Howard's Garden City utopia designed by Walt Disney, Epcot, in Bay Lake, Florida in 1966. And Epcot becomes an experiment for experimental prototype community of tomorrow and was a controlled, sanitized, and protected circular city in uh, um, 27,400 acres of land with a scope of designing not only a new theme park for entertainment, but also a new lifestyle and a series of living patterns. Disney truly believed in clean American entertainment and that happiness could be designed just like a city. And if only we could regulate pollution, trash, ventilation, and electricity effectively. He has been largely critiqued for his ideas by architectural and cultural critics of the time, for his earnest belief that the, the kind of control of environmental systems could really result in, the, in designated human emotions. And this is one critique in Architectural Design Magazine by critic Royston, Royston Landau, who was really advocating for cybernetics and uh, feedback systems and complexity theory at that time. In Epcot, each house had its own fuel cells. It was connected to a centralized waste collection system, water supply, and was using swamp plants and filtering plants to accomplish these tasks. It was also connected with, via a monorail that could take you anyway. But most importantly, like Buckminster Fuller's dome, the city was meant to be enclosed in a climate-controlled dome. In this area, shoppers and dwellers could enjoy entertainment free of weather changes. According to the magazine, the, uh, desi the, um, the design environment in 1973, the biggest achievement of Walt Disney World was the pollution control system with pneumatic tubes that would shoot the trash to designated locations, something like Roosevelt Island's pneumatic tubes today. 
And um, this was an underground network of channels contained in a series of si systems to handle the waste that the park produced. To Disney's disillusionment, he passed away in 1966. His vision never came to fruition, and it became a kind of um, entertainment park developed by um, his brother, Roy Disney. Disney, nevertheless, is still a world of its own, covered by internal rules and regulations, sometimes to its detriment. A year ago, um, a toddler was snatched by a crocodile, showing us the instability and unpredictability of self-organizing systems, and that in closed worlds, individual things may die, but what will live forever is the collective life of a system the aggregate community of the thriving closed worlds as a species of its own. And I'm moving to the third example that I want to share with you, the Integral Urban House, which was a domestic <coughs> organization in an urban setting envisioned by its founders as analogous to a healthy natural system. This is also something very different. It was the kind of a um, place of leftist thinkers that believed in self-reliance and wanted to grow their own food and uh, believed in, in, in back-to-the-roots kind of practices. Um, it was a typical house in Berkeley, California, retrofitted by the Farallones Institute to a highly productive testing bed for self-reliance and recycling of waste materials initiated by Elga and William Olkowski and founded by the nonprofit organization Farallones Institute. There is also an anonymous book under that name. What was interesting is that the house was exclusively human powered. It needed constant maintenance by its dwellers. Like a natural system, the energy resources were self-regulatory and structured so as to demand maintenance. Failure to do so naturally resulted in component parts ceasing their functions and affected other component <coughs> systems. Failure to properly sort through organic and inorganic waste would hinder composting, resulting in poorer mulch for vegetation and animal feed crops, cycling back into inferior food productivity for the inhabitant. Poor maintenance and coordination between the house's inhabitants would in turn result in insufficient input for the dwellers. It was a domino effect on all sides. As the inhabitants wrote in the book, every natural system works to perpetuate itself. The urban system could be understood as a self-perpetuating autopietic system of linear flows driven by sociological components, the human agents who through policy or lifestyle mandate its wasteful continuation. In the internal urban house, waste was not an externality to the system, but an index of the processes produced in this closed world. And the ambition was not to change the system holistically, but to change minor series of relations and certain parameters and to reorient waste as a productive byproduct that fosters different pa pathways. So, Looking through all of these three examples and, and generally all of the archive of the closed worlds that I, that I put together for the exhibition and the put, I came to the following realization. Despite the rigor of mathematical formulas of the easiness of the arrow, contained artificial ecosystems are unpredictable in their evolution. If subtle ruptures occurred in any of the system's parameters, there is no healing mechanism. Even though ecosystems are mostly portrayed in simulations with the use of arrows as robust and easy to maintain, the idea of self-sufficiency is compulsive and hysteric in the will to ceaselessly generate new life out of all wasteful cycles of production. A closed world, along with its dwellers, is a new type of unbalanced ecosystemic model susceptible to the shortcomings of digestion. All substances, fluids, and humors are ingested and excreted with the help of hidden machinery in a continuous process of material conversion. What remains a paradox is the manner in which this questionable model of total circular regeneration 
imbued with the vitalism of a digestive stomach, has prevailed as the mainstream model of what we now call a sustainable net zero habitat opposing energy loss. In this light, it is critical to question what degree resource conservation strategies are sustainable forms of practice, and also to recognize how impossible ideas become institutionalized through a series of bureaucratic mechanisms and are eventually labeled as eco-friendly, or even worse, as green. Originating, and I'm, I'm done, this is my last paragraph, so don't worry about the time. Originating from the space program and later going to countercultural groups experimenting with autonomous living, closed worlds depict in many respects how the whole Earth icon emerged as an idealized representation of collective faith and imagination. While studying the Earth as an object with contained resources, nature was sampled, systematized, and replicated through technological mediation. What became important in this process was the function of the system parts and its subcomponents tentatively assembled together. Closed worlds disclose the struggle to reconcile the utopian idea of replicating the Earth in its totality with a visceral and raw material reality of stuff unexpectedly generated from feedback loops. Somewhere between the idealization of the Earth as a whole as a complete and interconnected system, and the messy and fuzzy leftovers of human physiology lies an unexplored history of architecture dissolving into a reconstitution of natural systems. Thank you.